Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I am Lapo Bracconi, and on behalf of ETA Florence Renewable Energy, I welcome you to the IEA Bioenergy webinar series. Today's webinar is called An Introduction to Quantifying the Climate Effects of Bioenergy, and it will be moderated by Floor van der Hist from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and it will feature presentations by speakers Miguel Brandau from KT. IHH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, Ottavio Cavallet from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Norway, and from Stefan Meyer from the German Biomass Research Center in Germany. During the webinar, you can interact with your fellow attendees using the chat, and you can also uh, forward questions to the speakers using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom, of the Zoom client. You can also upvote each question that is asked to the speakers so that the questions that receive the most likes will appear higher up on the Q&A tab. Due to time constraints, not every question can be answered live by the speakers, but they may still answer in writing in the Q&A tab. The recording of this webinar will be available in a few days on IEA by Energy's website, so please make sure to check it out. Now, without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to our moderator, Flor, Flor van der Hist. Flor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lapo. And thank you also uh, to uh, Eta Florence for the technical support for the organizing this webinar. And good afternoon to you all, and welcome to this webinar on an introduction to quantifying climate effects of bioenergy. I'm very happy to see you all in these uh, large numbers. I think that is the upside of doing this virtually, so many people can access this either now or maybe later on in the recording. I think still people are coming into this webinar, just I think I make a very slow start. So we allow people to join uh, before we go to our uh, first speaker. So the objective of today is to provide you with more information on how the climate effects of bioenergy can be quantified. It's meant for academics, for policy makers, NGOs, industry, international collaborative organizations, students, in fact, for everyone that is interested in this topic. And before we start, uh, maybe I can just briefly introduce myself. I think it was already done by LAPO, but my name is Floor van der Hilst. I'm an associate professor at Copernicus Institute for Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. My research focuses on sustainable land use and sustainable production of biomass for the bio-based economy. And I'm also the co-chair of IEA Bio Bioenergy Task 45. And it is from this task that we organize this workshop. So IA Bioenergy Task 45 focuses on the sustainability of bioenergy in the wider context of the bioeconomy. And the objective of Task 5 is to increase the understanding of the environmental and also the socioeconomic impacts of producing and using biomass for the bioeconomy. And also to develop and apply the science-based methodologies and tools for assessing and quantifying these effects to better inform decision-making on these topics. So that is also what we'd like to do today, to have better information on how to quantify the climate effects of bioenergy, and we hope to support informed decision making by this. So it's such an important topic, so I'm very happy that many people can join or can watch the recording later. And why is it such an important topic? So we all know that we want to meet the Paris Agreement and therefore we need to have deep greenhouse gas mitigation um, options now. So to meet the 1.5 or two degrees uh, maximum temperature rise by the end of 21st century. So we need net zero by 2050 and even net negative emissions. And quant uh, scenario studies have, have um, indicated there's an important role for bioenergy here. But the big question here is, what is the climate effect of bioenergy? And there's no easy answer to that. And that, be that is because there are so many different options, right? Different systems. So different types of biomass, different conversion technologies, different end uses, different types of systems that it replaces, uh, different counterfactuals. Um, so therefore there's no one size fits all answer to this. And on top of that, there are many different uh, approaches, uh, methodologies, tools available to quantify these impacts. But also these are very different depending on the scope, on the system boundaries, the point of departure, the level of analysis of maybe even your world view. And that is the objective is today to shine some light on this complexity, to give you some guidance in this jungle of all these methods and, and methodologies and tools. And uh, within Task 45, Stefan Meyer and also colleagues of him developed 
a guide for the confused. So how to deal with all those different tools that are out there and how can they be used and for what purposes and in what context should we use those. So I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to uh, shed some light on this uh, very interesting but complex topic. And we have a very excellent line of, of, of speakers. So we will start with the presentation of Miguel Brandao on dispelling misconceptions on the climate effect of bioenergy with a hard system approach. Then we will continue with the presentation of Otavia Gavalet on the harmonization of biofuel life cycle assessment tools. And then we have a presentation of Stefan Meyer who will provide guidance on how to quantify the climate effects of bioenergy given all the availability of those different tools. So I hope after today, it's just an hour and a half, but I hope after today we have accomplished that all of you have a better overview and understanding and maybe feel a bit less overwhelmed by the complexity of this topic. So we have limited time, so I really would like to get started. Um, like Lapa already explained, you are very welcome to ask questions. You can put your questions in the, in the Q&A chat box, and I will monitor this uh, chat box uh, during the presentations. After the presentation, we have a short time available for answering questions. And I hope at the very end, after the three presentations, we have some more time also for Q&A. So, um, at the very end of the presentations and the Q&A, then also Stefan Meyer will give uh, um, uh, some closure remarks and also the take home message. So with that, I would like to go to our first speaker. Maybe Miguel, you can already start sharing your screen while I introduce you. So Miguel Brandau is an associate professor in industrial ecology and life cycle assessment at KTH in Stockholm. Over the past 15 years, he has taught and researched at a number of organizations around the world. He works with the use of hard system approaches that can robustly support decisions towards sustainable development. His research has focused on the integrated assessment of bio-based system, uh, bio systems with emphasis on their impacts on climate change, resource depletions, ecosystems, and biodiversity. So Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Flor. Can you hear me well? Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Flor, for your kind introduction to IEI for organizing this webinar, Stefan, the organizers. Thank you all, uh, and thank you for inviting me. So what I will be talking about today will be the uncertainty that we get from the methodol methodological choices that we do whenever we do a life cycle assessment of a bioenergy system. Um, I know that this is an introductory webinar on how to quantify climate change impacts of bioenergy systems, so I won't go into much detail about uh, perhaps some of the more sophisticated issues that have to be dealt with, but at the end of the presentation, you will be very well aware of what the key challenges are in modeling these systems appropriately. So this slide shows an overview, an outline of what we will cover and why bioenergy has become such an interesting strategy to combat and to mitigate climate change. So we all are aware of the urgent need to replace fossil fuels so that we can mitigate climate change. And within the options available, bioenergy systems were deemed to be a promising strategy. LCA was also recognized to be the appropriate tool or at least the appropriate framework with which to assess these bioenergy systems, so from cradle to grave. Uh, we will also see that the quantified benefits of bioenergy are very variable depending on the system at hand, but they also depend on the methodological choices made by the LCA practitioner. And this is an important issue, and indeed an issue of contention between the practitioners in the LCA community. So we will list a couple of unresolved methodological issues, particularly in the LCA of bioenergy systems. And then I will conclude with some insights and prospects in terms of the LCA's uncertainty and relevance in supporting decisions that mitigate climate change with bioenergy. Okay, so perhaps uh, the most simplistic view of bioenergy is that it is carbon neutral neutral because the carbon that is emitted upon combustion is the carbon that was sequestered 
during photosynthesis as the plants grew. So this, of course, does not take a life cycle approach and does not consider anything else than biogenic CO2. When one takes a life cycle approach, which was recognized uh, also in policy to be the appropriate framework, for example, the Renewable Energy Directive of the European Commission back in 2009, already acknowledged that the appropriate way to assess bioenergy systems would be to sum up the emissions that occur throughout the life cycle of a bioenergy product. So when one does that and takes into account the emissions occurring in the cultivation stage of the biofuel crop or tree or whatever it may be, as well as the processing um, emissions and so on and so forth, including the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions and including, very importantly, the carbon stock changes of the lands in which the biofuel crop is grown or indirectly, I will talk about that a bit later, something called the indirect land use change effects, then you will see that it's quite a complex endeavor to account for everything within the bioenergy system. But indeed, it's the only way that we can have a robust results with which to make decisions. Something that is a bit uh, counter to the things I've mentioned before is the issue of albedo, which can actually be favorable to uh, agricultural systems, including uh, biofuel systems. So this is something published in 1997. So this is very, a very long time ago. Um, and it was published by IEA. I don't think the framework here was referred to as LCA, as life cycle assessment, but nonetheless, the appropriate viewpoint was adopted, which was that bioenergy systems would have to be compared to a fossil reference system on the basis of their life cycle emissions. So this was a very nice recognition again in another community that LCA was the appropriate tool to consider whether biofuel systems were actually favorable in terms of climate change or not. Now, something I want to focus here is that depending on the practitioner, the LCA results uh, of, if one, for example, does a, a carbon footprint with a life cycle approach, not necessarily the LCA results across other impacts, one will see that depending on a few methodological choices that will that I will talk about in a couple of slides time, you will see that the results are extremely variable. So here you have a few, what the European Commission calls pathways. So these are feedstock to final biofuel options. And you have for several options for ethanol and FAM and HVO and biogas, you can see that depending on the methodological choice taken, the results in terms of, let's say, grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of biofuel are extremely variable, extremely variable. And if one further compares the fossil reference, which is around 94 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule, so this red line here, and the need to save up to 65% of those emissions, which is the, um, the threshold for the European Commission, from 2021 onwards, which is represented by this um, green line here, then you will see that some of these pathways are not actually very favorable in the sense of mitigating climate change. And more than that, they are very variable, some of them ranging from around 50 to 300 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. So this is important because this uses the same input data. So any variability you see on this chart is not because of any differences in inputs. It's just a difference in the methodological choices that the practitioner does on four different items that I will talk about. So do methodological choices really matter in the LCA of bioenergy systems? The short answer is yes, they do. And hopefully... By presentation, you will see that uh, this is the case indeed. So what are these issues? What are these unresolved issues in the, in the life cycle assessment of bio-based systems? The 
First one, if I can call it like that, if I can attribute these issues to particular phases of the LCI, the first one is concerned with the goal and scope definition. So this is when we decide what kind of question you're answering and the kind of modeling approach you decide to adopt. Without wanting to, to go into very specific terms in LCI, there are two terms, two modeling approaches that implicitly or explicitly the practitioner adopts, which is the attributional and the consequential approach that affects the way the system boundary is delimited. And with that, it affects whatever processes go in and whatever is left out of the assessment. It also affects how co-production is handled. You may have heard about how contentious allocation issues are in the LCA of all systems, not just bio-based. And in the case of bio-based systems particularly, we also have another issue, which is which reference system you adopt for land use. So whatever was grown on the land that is now providing you with the crop that is turned into the biofuel affects the results immensely. And not just that, also the indirect land use change, which I will talk about later on. So these are the two issues that relate to the goal and scope definition. And then the third issue is a completely separate issue to the way you model your technosphere. It's more related with how you characterize your greenhouse gas emissions and particularly how you characterize them with respect to time. And characterizing emissions according to the time they're emitted is important particularly for biogenic carbon. And in fact, this differentiation was, um, was uh, suggested exactly because there was a need to differentiate biogenic carbon from fossil carbon. So these are the three issues I will talk about and I will show you how, my, how results are sensitive to different approaches within each of these unresolved issues. So I will start with uh, the definitions that were given by the Shonen LCA data by, database guidance principles. These are a bit of a mouthful, so you will forgive me for that, but I think they are important so that you understand the, the main difference between the two. So the attributional approach is a system modeling approach in which inputs and outputs are attributed to the functional unit of a product system by linking and or partitioning the unit processes of the system according to a normative rule. And that normative rule may be to delimit the system economically or energetically or on mass basis or whatever it may be. On the other hand, you have the consequential approach, which is a system modeling approach in which activities in a product system are linked so that activities are included in the system to the extent that they are expected to change as a consequence of a change in the demand for the functional unit. I know these definitions are quite long and perhaps difficult to understand, but from as far as I know, these are the two best definitions for the terms and the two that are more mutually exclusive than any other that have been proposed. So with that in mind, we can see how the two vary uh, in an illustrative way, I think. Ah, there we are. Uh, so on the left, you have... Uh, the attributional approach. On the right, you have the consequential approach. And you can see, for example, the global emissions represented by the circle. And what the attributional approach tries to do is to attribute a share of the total emissions to the different product systems. So they are additive and they add up to the total of whatever may be produced in a given year. The consequential approach, however, does not take into account emissions that would have occurred anyway, but just the emissions that happen at the margin as a result of your decision to supply us with another functional unit, as well as whatever emissions are avoided as a consequence of co-production. This is the substitution approach as opposed to the attributional approach of partitioning the product system. Um, Okay, so does it matter in the outcome? Yes, it does. Uh, and this is a paper I published last year with a few of my colleagues. And you can see four different approaches here for the different uh, feedstocks. So in each pathway, you have the first two bars showing the way the European Commission 
recommends you to model your product system. And then you have the attributional approach and the consequential approach across all of the different feedstocks. And you can see here that particularly the consequential approach is the one that seems to be more variable in comparison to the other ones. Uh, you will also find the 94 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule here as the red line and the green line it represents the need to save 65% relative to the fossil fuel reference. And you can also see that most of the uh, feedstocks actually do not meet the European Commission's criterion uh, unless they are modeled consequentially for some of the feedstocks. The other notion that is very important in this development of how to assess biofuel systems with life cycle assessment is this notion of indirect land use change. Uh, again, the European Commission perhaps did not recognize that in the beginning as a, as a true concern, but it certainly did uh, a few years later. So just to illustrate what indirect land use change is, imagine that you have a field of wheat grown in the UK uh, and that wheat is turned into ethanol. Uh, but before that you had grasslands. So you converted grasslands onto annual or arable croplands. And as a result, there may be some direct emissions because the soil organic carbon stock levels are uh, larger here than they are in annual cropland because you know the soil is cultivated annually instead of uh, otherwise. Uh, so there are direct emissions arising from this conversion, but if you, in addition, consider that this grassland was used to feed cattle, where's my cursor here, uh, then that means that whatever was being fed by this plot of land is no longer taking place, which means that if the system is to balance, and we should also always balance the system in LCI, then a similar amount of feed will have to be produced by the marginal producer, which in the case of uh, feed protein is soybean mills produced in, for example, South America, like Argentina, at the expense of perhaps rainforest. So the conversion of rainforest to soybean production would have to be taken into account whenever you're assessing wheat produced in land that was previously grassland in the UK. So these are what I call the elements of the reference system, which was later called indirect land use change by Sir Chinger and others. So this is an important component, perhaps determinant of the carbon footprints of the biofuels. Now, one of my most recent articles was when I tried to see what would happen if we met the renewable, the renewable fuel standard obligation of producing 15 billion gallons of ethanol from corn in the US, whether that would actually result in climate change mitigation or on the contrary, whether it would contribute to the climate change problem. So we have 15 billion gallons, which is essentially 45 million tons of bioethanol being produced from corn. Uh, the land that is already used for corn will continue being used for corn, but more land will be needed and also we estimated, I estimated that there will be diversion from other sectors like the food sector, which sees diversion of 9 million tons of corn annually, as well as, well as the export markets. So if we consider that these two markets are to be balanced, then corn will have to be grown elsewhere at the expense of direct land use change or intensification. So all of this is accounted for as is the co-production of dry distiller grains with solubles, around 37 million tons annually, which is then absorbed in the animal feed and vegetable oil markets, and thereby displacing um, soybean meal, because soybean meal is the marginal supplier for feed protein, uh, but requiring more feed corn to be grown, as well as more palm oil, because when you display soybean meal, you also display soybean oil. So the vegetable oil market has to compensate by increasing palm oil production. So when you include how the market balances as a whole, you get results like this. So you have gains arising from the avoided uh, soybean cultivation, which you can see here. Also uh, the avoided um, gasoline, which is this uh, 
red, dark red part of the bar, uh, and so on, and also the added emissions. So in the end, even though you save on a domestic level, if you're looking at it from a, uh, from a US perspective, you serve, save around 170 million tons of CO2 equivalent, you add around 190 million tons of CO2 equivalent, which means that you are no longer um, saving emissions. On the contrary, you would be making climate change worse in this particular case of using corn ethanol uh, as a strategy to mitigate climate change. It shows here that it is not the best strategy to deal with climate change at all. Uh, okay, and then, so I talked about indirect land use change. I talked about the different ways of modeling your product system attributionally and consequentially. I will show you how this impacts on the results. But before that, I want also to show you that in terms of the LCIA method adopted, so the characterization model for uh, greenhouse gas emissions that take into account the timing of emissions, you will see that again, with the same input data, so you have the exactly same system being um, where you apply the, the metric, uh, bioenergy is either better or worse than the fossil fuel it replaces. So again, this is variability and uncertainty coming from not what I've been talking about so far, but from the LCIA methods uh, applied. Now, when you put all of this together and you try to quantify the uncertainty from the different uh, parameters, you will see that uh, there's quite a few uncertainty, quite a few variability coming from the uh, feedstock use, depending on the feedstock. There's quite a lot of uncertainty about uh, how land use change and indirect land use change are included, if at all. All these charts show a variation of 300 to minus 300 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. There's also a bit of variability coming from the modeling approach. And perhaps a little surprisingly, not so much from the LCIA method, but remember that uh, if in the example I've shown you, this is about forest bioenergy, there, were, there was not much difference with, with annual crops. Uh, and this includes 15 LCIA methods. This one only includes, only includes two methods, which is GWP and GTP over 20 and 100 years. But nonetheless, there seems to be not much uncertainty coming from these four ways of characterizing GHG emissions. Okay, so I'm coming to an end. Um, I would just like to show you something that I consider quite, quite a good insight whenever you think about LCA models and how they can support decision-making relative to a renewable energy policy, for example. I would like to show you a distinction that is made between precision and accuracy. Uh, here you see a precise results. So there's a high precision here as the variability is low between the different estimates. But the difference to the real value, which of course we don't know, is very large. So the accuracy is quite low. So you could call these results biased, which is something you do whenever you don't consider indirect effects like indirect land use change. On the other hand, you can have a situation where, you, where your results are accurate, so they are somewhere around the bullseye, even though the precision is low because they're very far apart from one another. So the variability here is very high, but nonetheless, you can say that your results are representative. And also I would like to quote Tribush and El Sayed, quite an old quote, a 40 years old quote, who say, who say that it is much more important to be able to survey the set of possible systems approximately than to examine the wrong system exactly. It is better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Which brings me to my final slides in terms of LCA for decision support on biofuel systems. I think LCA for policy support in general is growing because there are several international developments and ongoing initiatives taking place, which result in better methods, better databases, and better software. Uh, 
However, there's still a lack of consensus and therefore increasing harmonization is very much needed in LCA practice if the results that we produce can be considered to be robust as well as reproducible. In terms of LCA of bioenergy systems specifically, we saw that uh, biofuels are not necessarily better than the fossil fuels they replace. It really depends on the system under analysis. LCA helps us in identifying the best and the worst systems. So I think the tool still plays a role in climate change mitigation, the tool and uh, bioenergy systems, of course. So the message for policymakers here is that the good systems should be promoted while the bad ones should be discouraged. But I think one of the main insights of this presentation is that methodological choices do determine the results in particular, the delimitation of the system boundary and indirect effects needs to be taken care of. And finally, I'd just like to say that all models are wrong, of course, but some are useful. Uh, the important thing is that we do not shift burdens to places where we can see them. We cannot just uh, sweep emissions under the carpet. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Miguel, and uh, a very interesting and packed uh, um, presentation. So I can imagine there are quite some questions about this. Uh, for the sake of time, I would like to leave it the uh, amount of questions to only two that I've selected for now, but I would like to invite you, Miguel, to also reply to the questions in the chat. The first question, I think it's a short question and can also have a short answer, is does this LCA approach also apply to woody biomass from forest? Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. So I think that is helpful for the people that, uh, that asked this question. And also um, the other question or also some remarks were made about the assumptions made about indirect land use change. So the, assumed, the assumptions made on what, what type of land is replaced and uh, where this indirect land use change occurs highly affects the result of your LCA output. Can you reflect on that uh, briefly? Uh, yes, I can. You're right. It is a very contentious and uncertain um... A part of the model. Uh, it's, this is not a reason why you should be excluded. On the contrary, it needs to be addressed. But, but yes, it is uncertain and it can account for a very large chunk of the overall emission level. What I did in the slide that I showed you was that I saw where the marginal suppliers were of the different crops and feedstocks like soybean meal. These were the largest produce, not the largest producers, but the producers or the countries experiencing the highest rates of growth in the last decade. And then in those countries, we saw which lands were expanding and which lands were contracting. And with that information, you can estimate uh, the amount of land and which type of land uh, goes into production of these marginal crops. And then you can see that the carbon differences between those lands um, how they translate into into CO2 equivalents. Thank you, Miguel. And I think there are even more questions on this uh, topic in the chat. So maybe during the other presentation, while listening to the sure. presentation, also respond to the questions in the chat. And maybe a reminder to the audience, please put your questions in the Q&A chat and not in the regular chat, because there we have an overview of all the, all the questions. Um, I think we should move on to our next speaker um, because of the sake of time. Thank you very much, Miguel. And maybe, Otav, you can start sharing your uh, screen and I will introduce you in the meantime. So, Otavio Cavalet is a senior researcher at the Industrial Ecology Program at Norway, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He's the former leader of the sustainability team at the Brazilian Renew Renewable National Laboratory in Brazil. He has been carrying out research on various sustainability aspects of bioenergy in the past 15 years, including some activities in the context of IEA Bioenergy Task 39 and also 45. And he was also a contributing author for the IPC Special Report on Land and Climate Change and the forthcoming IPC Sixth Assessment Report in the chapter related to climate, uh, climate change mitigation in the transport sector. So with that, I will give you the floor to Otavio. Thank you, Flor, very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Aie Bavene, for organizing this, this uh, seminar and for inviting uh, me to, to participate here. I will present this work on harmonization of biofuel GHG emission assessment. 
first of all, I want to clarify this is not only my work. It's a work that has been carried out mostly from my former colleague at the Brazilian Bioenergies Lab in, in Campinas, Brazil. But also we had collaboration from the University of British Columbia and and Rail in in US during this this project. Um, the main outputs of this project are to these two papers and the two reports that are available in the IA Task 39 um, webpage. And what we'll be talking today is mostly about this first paper we published in 2018 or 19, I don't remember very well, about uh, ethanol uh, production routes and the comparison of them. A little bit about the context of this of this work. So we have talked about this today, but I will recap a little bit. So we know that bioenergy is expected to play a key role in the decarbonization of the transport sector, mostly uh, not only for road, but also for aviation and shipping, for example. And uh, uh, this uh, this role will depend very much in the reduction of the of the potential reduction of these GHG emissions in comparison to the fossil alternatives. And these GHG emissions are calculated using uh, life cycle assessment tools and methods. But we can obtain different results as, as uh, Miguel just presented today. But even when we use uh, for the same biofuels, for the same uh, feedstock, uh, for the same region, when we use different tools. Uh, we that, that have been working with, with uh, JG accounting for biofuels for a while, maybe we, we know how to deal with it and we, we already expect the difference, we know where they come from and, and uh, what are the context of these differences. But in uh, energy or energy policy or decision making perspective, this difference may be perceived as a source of concern. Then what we have done is to assess the main differences and commonalities regarding the structure, the calculation methods, the assumptions that are underlying these different LCA tools for, for uh, GG assessment of bioenergy. And we want to provide a better understanding on, on how and why these results are different. We selected four LCA tools for, for this analysis that, that have typical or default values for most common biofuel pathway for conventional ethanol, cellulosic ethanol, which is, which is not uh, that common, but, uh, but we also compare that, and, and biodiesel. And what I mean here uh, is that we use uh, for this analysis tools that already have a description of input data for specific fuels in different regions. We know that there are other tools, for example, the RSB tool, the bon sucre calculator, that uh, can calculate, that are, are, are commonly used to calculate uh, JG emissions from different fuels, but those are, are tools that the, the user has to input their data. And what we have done here is compare tools that already come with data that are uh, uh, referred as, as typical or default for, for different uh, fuels. In this work, we compared biograce that was originally intended as a tool to operationalize the EU directive on biofuels. GGG in, in, in new, of course. GGG Genius, which is a tool that, that has been developed in Canada. The grid model from, from Argonne in the US. And the virtual sugarcane biorefinery in, from Brazil, which is more like a research oriented LCA tool intended for, for LCA research purposes. It's not really a open source uh, calculator as the other models, but we use to compare with, with the other models in this work. Here we have a few characteristics of this model. One important thing is that uh, you see here the, the version of the different tools that we use in this comparison. Uh, and you see that some are quite uh, some years old now. This is because we started this work actually in 2016. So we have to freeze the models at some time, at some point in time to, to, to do our analysis. And uh, we do recognize that, that a few of these tools have been updated since then. Um, another important aspect is that uh, when we started the work, only BioGrace had some uh, regulatory use. Uh, intention because it was 
as I mentioned, intended for, for operationalized EU directive from 2009, but the others not. But actually what happens later is that most of them have been used in regulatory framework as well. For example, grid model has different version that has been used for the low carbon fuel standard in California and Oregon, for example. GAG Genius also has been used for the British Columbia low fuel carbon standard. And also the DSB has been used as a, as a basis for creating the Renova Calc, which is the, the calculator for the Renova BU program in Brazil. Well, the different models also, they can use different climate metrics. They do choose a, a, a default climate metric, but some of them you are able to, to change it. They also have different background data that are, that are used. Some are internal, some use commercial data banks as, as uh, echo invent. Others have, have their inter own internal data bank. You can also choose different functional units, for example. You can see result per megajoule or per kilometer driven with a typical car in different countries. One thing that Miguel also mentioned that, that's very important is how they treat the products in different models. We see that JG Genius and Greek use substitution or ex system expansion to deal with, uh, with multi functionality, while BioGrace use energy because it's, it's what's recommended in the European Union directive, and DSB use economic allocation. Some of the models also have uh, models to calculate specific direct. Um, land use change, carbon emissions from direct land use change, and they also have different uh, possible reference systems. Let's take a deeper look in different case studies, starting, in, starting with the case for sugarcane ethanol in Brazil. And then what we get is that results can vary quite a lot from 16 to 45 grams of CO2 per megajoule in the, in, with the use in the different models. So it is for sugarcane in Brazil using different models, we get different results. And then we can start to explore why. Well, main difference come from, of course, the agricultural part. So, so how the different models consider the sugarcane production system, how they do, they consider also the, the ethanol production, which means that the conversion system, and also this um, purple part, which is the shipping part. So GRIT and JG News consider that ethanol is shipped to North America, and then that's why we have larger impacts from shipping there. Also biogas consider shipping to Europe. So and while VSB doesn't consider any shipping. So this is already one source of, of differences in the models. But taking a deeper look only in the part of sugarcane production, so the, so the agricultural part, starting with this uh, green part, which is the largest difference, we see that um, differences come from different uh, aspects. For example, the amount of fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer that are used as input in different models quite different from 0 0.8 to 1.2 in the VSB. Um, well, it's higher in the VSB because uh, in that model, we don't use average data, but agronomic recommendation for nitrogen use in sugarcane. And that this, this, uh, this recommendation is quite conservative. So it's, it's better to, to apply a little bit more than necessary to guarantee the, the, the expected use. Also different models with their different parts, for example, but grid and biograce only because their emissions from, from the synthetic fertilizer while GG Genius and BSB also consider that, that we have the nitrogen emissions from industrial waste and crop residues and soil and roots that, that are also responsible for some nitrogen emissions. Uh, another important factor is the, the initial factor for N2O. We know that N2O is quite an important climate forcer for, for bioenergy, for, for, for climate change. So it, it is an important and well, BioGrace is the only one that used the IPCC default data as they are, while the others, they do some adaptation for the different crops in different countries. And then that's why we see differences in the highest one is for GAG genius. 
We also see significant differences in the background so, uh, for fertilizer production. So the emissions for fertilizer production in biogas is almost twice the one uh, that's used in VSB. And is, this is also a source of, of, of this difference for, for nitrogen. Looking at diesel now, we also in this uh, yellow part, we see also uh, a large difference. For example, GG Genius is the highest emission because it, it uses much more liters of diesel per ton of cane than other models. Also, it is the one that has the highest emissions for diesel production and combustion in comparison to, to other models. Another interesting thing is also that uh, grid uses not only diesel, but uh, an amount of um, gas and gasoline and electricity as energy input for the, for the agricultural system. It, this, this happens because of the way that this model uh, models the, the, the energy system in the grid model. But yeah, then we see quite a large difference also in the diesel use for different models. Another important fact is the from, from burning of sugarcane before harvesting, both grid and DSB, they have similar results uh, or similar amounts of, of mechanical harvesting for sugarcane um, that reflects the, the current trend for, for sugarcane in Brazil, while biogas takes a conservative approach, assuming that all this, all this straw is burned before harvesting. Why geogenius, this value is zero, so no, no harvesting, no burning before harvesting. But they say that um, the user could change it and uh, they, they, they take zero as a default value, but, but uh, they recommend the, the, the user to change it. Uh, taking a, a look now on the conversion phase, the results are not that different, but with biogas, they are a little bit higher because of the decision that uh, the inputs for the conversion phase are, are they receive a penalty of 40% to incentivize the producer to use their own data and not use the default data that they use in the, in the EU directive. Then what we have done is that to try to harmonize the different tools, a little bit uh, work, a little bit in, on the other direction that, that uh, Miguel there has shown, like instead of showing all the possible variation that you could get for the same system, we try to make them as more similar by harmonizing different input data or assumptions. For example, here we have the different results for the four different models for sugarcane in Brazil. And we put all of them with the same allocation, all of them using uh, economic allocation. Then all of them having the same shipping and transportation and use, all of them with the same nitrogen and limestone and soil burning, all the same using the same inputs for the agricultural part, the same using the same inputs for the ethanol production part, and we get that results are very similar. So what we have done here is to demonstrate that with a few harmonization uh, steps, we can make the different models get very similar outcomes. And this is very interesting. Uh, we have done the same for sugar, for corn ethanol uh, in the US with uh, collaboration with NREL. We see here the inputs for the corn production phase. Uh, the total impacts are not that different, but the contribution from different uh, parts are quite different. For example, the use of diesel is quite different from bio, in biogas, it's like one other magnitude higher than than the diesel consumption in grit and GG and GAG genius. Um, also, the amount of fertilizers are much higher in grit and GG genius in comparison to biograce. Also, again, impacts on, on GAG genius are higher, not only because it has the higher use of nitrogen per ton of corn, but also the higher emission factor for M4. But the production of, of, of fertilizer here is not that different, but still it's, it's different. For the, the conversion of corn into ethanol, 
the, the total inputs are not that different. They are mostly energy inputs, but they are different in the in the in the inputs. For example, while biogas reflects more European conditions where only natural gas is used as source of energy for the process, Brit and G -G Genius try to model the conditions for North America, where also coal and electricity are used as, as, as energy sources for, for conversion. Here we have done the same harmonization approach with the three models that three tools that have uh, corn ethanol uh, in their calculations. So all of them are harmonizing using allocation by system expansion. Then we, we harmonize the transport systems, the use of nitrogen and limestone, the use of energy in, in the agricultural operations, and the final results, which again are very similar. So again, they can be harmonized with a few steps in the value chain. We have done the same for with ethanol here, going a little bit uh, quicker in the results. Again, the results can be harmonized with the same uh, few parameters. We can get very similar results. The, the conclusion here is that when we see all the ethanol GHG emissions together, they seem very different here from, from a comparison point of view. But uh, we have seen that with a few harmonization steps, they can get very closer and we can really trace back why we have these differences and where they come from. We also have done the same harmonization for cellulosic ethanol from residues. We see that results again vary a lot from around seven to, to around 23, depending on, on the feedstock. We see that, that the larger contribution comes from the conversion process, processing. That's because we have a lot of energy inputs and also the use of enzymes for, for ethanol, cellulosic ethanol production but also from the procurement of residues and also for the way they treat the co-products. So, so how they do with, with the allocation or, or, or system expansion for the electricity that's co-generated in this system. In general, we also uh, see that harmonizing results with the same key inputs and, and assumptions results get very similar. We also have done this, this work for several biodiesel a production routes. Here I'm just showing soybean biodiesel in Brazil. And we see that, of course, for, for biodiesel, we have more harmonization steps because we have this the, the look emission here and also the two steps that's the oil extraction and transitification for production of biodiesel. But again, results can get very similar after harmonization. Um, then my final slide here is the take home message. We can see that outcomes of uh, life cycle assessment tools can be harmonized with a few steps considering key parameters and methodological assumptions. Uh, these results can be more comparable and easy to communicate with relatively small modifications, which means that it's not that we need completely new models or we need to, we need to, to build new LCA tools from scratch is just that with a few harmonization or a few modification in the existing tools, they can really get very similar and, and harmonized results. But of course, there is still room for standardization in the various LCA tools, while still recognizing that they are done or intended for different applications. They are done in different contexts. Some are for uh, implementation of specific biofuel policies. So still with different contexts, we still can harmonize them. And we see that updates in the life cycle, inventory data and, and the flexibility in the treatment in the treatment of both products are may, most maybe the most the two most important factors that we can work on for improved harmonization of life cycle assessment tools. Once more, I would like to thank the partners in this work. It's that that have been contributing over the years and also to the model developers that have contributed to, to this work and collaborating with information and, and open their tools for, for this analysis. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Many thanks, Otavio. And, uh, and again, a very packed presentation. It's very uh, interesting to see that looking at the same system, so different results can come out of it. And but it also provides hope that you that you can harmonize and come to more similar results. And I would like to pick one of the questions that were put in the Q and A uh, chat box, and it's maybe a, a bit of a, a devil's advocate uh, question. So why put so much effort on harmonizing? And does it mean that it becomes even because they are more uh, harmonized and maybe more precise, but are they also more accurate? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. I guess the effort for harmonizing them is to avoid the confusion that that we could get from from saying that different from as, as you said different same different tools for the same system in the same region could give different results and then if they har harmonize it that at least uh, results are more comparable. I guess it's not here a, a, a question of accuracy or or. Um, about the thing, but yeah, preciseness, <laughs> preciseness, yes, uh, because the models are to reflect typical data, and, and this is not what we are trying to do. What we're trying to do is to be more um, average possible and reflect more the same assumptions in the in the, in the different tools. It's a, not a matter of being right and wrong. It's a matter of using the same um assumptions for it and i guess that's what we're trying to do here and to see that with same assumptions and maybe upgrade we, we have data that reflect the same situation we get very similar results yeah so the system become more comparable exactly thank i have one more question and I, I am hoping for a short answer because we are a bit stretching the time here uh one of the questions uh was also about the fossil system so the fossil counterpart that we compare to um, so we are very precise in modeling uh, um, and quantifying the uh, the bioenergy part, and then we compare to fossil counterpart. Are the damages done by fossil uh, well represented in the in LCA? Do you think? Because you also mentioned different values for greenhouse gas emissions from fossils. Do you think it's a fair comparison, and are the the damages done by by fossils um, well enough represented? Yeah, that's a very good question. I guess I guess you are right that we don't put the same effort to measure the the, the impact from the fossil systems the same way we do for biofuels, and uh, there are a series of um, well of leakages for methane and all these things that should be very well represented in the different contexts of different countries. When you're doing this, we also use uh, reference systems that that are um, not that well suited for certain countries, and we use more average data. Um, I know that for for Brazil, we try to 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 to, to customize the fossil systems for Brazilian context. The others also have done something similar, and um, I guess there is some effort for that. But I don't think uh, it's definitely we also could do uh, harmonization work in the fossil as well. We should do that. Thanks, Otavio. And there are many more questions in the in the chat, so please also have a look at the, the Q and A, and maybe you can answer already some um, in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then I would like to proceed to our final presenter, Stefan. And maybe Stefan, you can already start sharing your uh, your screen. Then I can, in the meantime, can introduce you. So Stefan Meyer is a senior researcher at the German Biomass Research Center in Leipzig, in Germany. He is coordinating a working group on the applied sustainability assessment of bioenergy technologies and bio-based product systems for over 10 years. He worked mainly focused on sustainability assessment, case studies, aspects related to sustainability certification, as well as sustainability governance for the German bioeconomy. And since 2018, he is the German NTL for IA Bioenergy Task 45. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Floor. I hope you can hear me okay. Great. All right. So first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure for me uh, to present in this webinar after Miguel and Otavio and uh, to provide you with some insights into the results of an IA Task 45 project we have been working on over the last month. Um, and we started this project since we experienced a constantly growing demand for information about the GHG intensity of bioenergy systems and bioenergy pathways.
and even more so also a demand for more knowledge and information regarding available tools that you could use to start your own and individual calculation for specific bioenergy pathways and systems. So um, since not everyone is an expert in the field, um, we decided to set up this project within IEA Task 45 um, to specifically address non-experts and people that actually just started to educate themselves uh, in this specific topic. So um, in our daily work with uh, partners from industry, but also with policymakers or even with scientists from other disciplines, we are very often confronted with like the same questions over and over again, which could look like those. So for example, which tools are available, which tools are free to use, and which tools could I use to calculate GHG emissions of different bioenergy pathways. So what are, for example, uh, also important elements that have to be considered in the assessment that should not be forgotten because they can make a difference. Um, also the question, what, like, what is the right calculation tool for my type of question for, for the things that I try to study and to understand? And how can I use the results uh, of existing calculation tools? So how can I interpret them and how can I use them? Um, I don't know, for comparisons or for reporting activities and other things like that. So in order to address these questions, we have set up this internal uh, project, uh, which actually aimed at uh, developing a guide on available tools um, that can be used to quantify the climate change effects of bioenergy systems and bioenergy technologies, and to address the needs of different target groups and different stakeholders with also different levels of knowledge, I would say. Um, uh, by including not only the tools and the list of tools, but also a little bit of description and characteristics to understand better how they can be used. And uh, another thing that is very important, and that was very important for us from the beginning, is that we do not all alone want to have this inventory of tools, but we also wanted to give a little bit of uh, discussion and illustration about potentially important aspects within the assessment of bioenergy pathways. So things that should not be forgotten when you start your assessment or your first assessment. So um, as you have heard from the previous presentation, this whole topic of greenhouse gas assessment and understanding the climate effects of bioenergy systems can be very complex and comprehensive. And therefore, I think it's also very important to understand um, and to differentiate a little bit what different kind of perspectives and sectors are in existence. So um, for this presentation, I will differentiate four main areas that we that also have been very important for us when we worked on the on the report and on the guide. So the first one is an assessment on the product level. And uh, what you've just heard from Ottavio, for example, was I think a perfect example for this. So when you calculate an assessment for a specific biofuel, for a specific biofuel producer, using a feedstock from a specific producer, a farmer, um, that would be a calculation, for example, and an assessment on a product level. Uh, typically, this can be done to understand um, the overall emissions of the different products uh, um, or for example, the different processes that are involved in the supply chain, also to understand potential drivers, look for optimization potentials, for example, and to do maybe comparisons of this specific biofuel to another uh, biofuel or to a benchmark energy carrier, which could be a fossil-based one. Um, there are certain standards that are established. Um, Miguel was talking about the difference between attributional and consequential LCA. So there's an ISO standard for life cycle assessment, which is mainly addressing uh, attributional LCA. But it, that's, I think that's a, that's a good starting point if, in case you want to understand more about the methodology behind it. Also, there's a standard from the greenhouse gas protocol and other standard methodologies that could be a starting point for these kinds of assessments. In addition, there are other aspects and perspectives that you can take. For example, there are methodologies and tools that you could use to understand the climate effects of projects. So for example, if you want to understand the impact, the future impact of a change in your system, um, 
I don't know, for example, if you are a producer of something and you want to change your energy supply, switching from a fossil-based one to a bio-based one, um, that kind of assessment could help you to understand how the overall greenhouse gas emission impacts of that specific part of your supply chain might change over time. Also here, there are certain standards that could be used the greenhouse gas protocol for project accounting is, is one example. Another aspect are assessments on a company level. So um, probably a lot of you are familiar with the GHG protocol um, approach, uh, which is used by uh, more and more companies to understand the uh, climate effects of their activities in different parts um, of their supply chains and different, uh, uh, so, so to speak, operations. And uh, usually this is broken down into different scopes, scope one and two and scope three. And um, together, those scopes define the greenhouse gas inventory um, of the reporting of the company, and that can be used for reporting activities, for example, and also, also to support strategies to reduce emissions over time. And then finally, um, there are accountings um, on a sector level. Uh, so for example, the monitoring of emissions from specific industrial sectors or sectors like agriculture and forestry to understand how the emissions and also, for example, carbon stocks in these, in these sectors change over time and uh, which, which impact they might have. So um, for the work on the, on the guide and the, at the project report, I would say that especially the first three of these areas have been pretty important for us. And a lot of the tools that we included are um, oriented or are, are placed within the th first three sectors. So um, the report and the project actually had two main pillars. The first one was about inventorizing existing tools, describing them, characterizing them, and providing a little bit of decision support for tool selection. And the second aspect was about discussing um, potentially relevant parameters for the assessment. So like I said before, things that should not be forgotten or things that should be considered when conducting uh, a greenhouse gas assessment. So I'm going to start with the first one to give you a little bit of insight about what you can expect there. So uh, I'm starting with, the, with a quick snapshot into the inventory uh, for the tools that we have selected. Um, so uh, we actually, we did an investigation about uh, on, on available tools and all of the tools that we could found, we actually structured them into three broader categories in order to allow for a better orientation, I would say. The first one, uh, you just heard four perfect examples of them, uh, of those in Otavio's presentation. Those are calculators for biomass and bioenergy pathways including, for example, BioGrace that you just heard, uh, Greed or GG Genius and other things. Um, the second area included calculators and models for agricultural systems. Um, so tools, for example, to calculate emissions for, for specific uh, crop rotations uh, and for activities in different uh, soil and climate conditions, for example. And the third sector that is included uh, focuses on tools for more specific emission sources and removal, such as, for example, tools to estimate the impact of agricultural or forestry land use activities on carbon stock changes or for example, emissions, uh, emission inventories of, of cities and other things. So um, let's say that this, all, of, all three of them cover very, very broad uh, topics altogether. Um, we have described and characterized within uh, the guide, the different tools that we found according to um, a huge number of parameters. So for example, <clears throat> we focused on things like the general availability. So are these tools uh, free to use or is it necessary to buy a license or uh, something, something comparable? There's specific focus on different regions, for example, different feedstocks or different technologies, but also aspects like, um, for example, links to specific methodologies or legislation. So some of these tools can be used or could be used in the past to show that uh, the, the greenhouse gas intensity of a specific bioenergy system is a, below a certain threshold, for example, within a national legislation. Um, I think that that's an important information. Also things like options to include um, emissions from land use change into the calculations or effects from carbon sequestration, things like that, uh, and a lot more. And um, since including 
all of these aspects um, in the inventories of the tool can lead to very comprehensive descriptions, which again can be a little bit or can be a little bit messy. Uh, we decided to um, include another aspect and to think about a way of using the results to provide a little bit of uh, support for selecting the appropriate tool um, that can be used in case you have a specific question or you find yourself within a specific geographic scope or your interest is in a very specific technology. So what, what we included is uh, a couple of what we call decision trees, uh, which should help you to select your tool. So for example, we started with an overview on potentially potential objectives of the user. So for example, if you're interested in uh, a reporting on a product level, um, maybe your geographical scope of interest is the United States and you are interested in a specific technology, which could be corn ethanol, um, then the guide will um, guide you or the report will guide you to a specific tool that could be appropriate or that you could look at and start to understand and see if this is the right tool for you. So for example, uh, the greed model family uh, could provide some help with your specific um, question under these parameters. Another example is, for example, if you're in the European Union uh, trying to understand the greenhouse gas impact of a biomass chain based on woody biomass, so pellets or wood chips, for example, there are a couple of calculators and tools that are available that we included um, in the tool. So this is, this is a way of structuring and presenting the results, which hopefully um, will support the selection process um, for people, especially that are not aware of all the options and possibilities that are out there. So um, that being said, I would like to continue and go to the second very important pillar of uh, the report, which is about uh, discussing some of the most important and relevant parameters within the assessment. So like I said before, the things that should not be forgotten, uh, or at least should be considered um, when conducting a greenhouse gas assessment for specific technologies. So um, the general logic um, for the example that I'm going to show you here and briefly present you here is mainly based um, on the logic of a product related assessment. That actually means that we started with the de definition of, a, of, of system boundaries and the decision about which processes should be included within the system boundaries. So here you see a very simplified um, supply chain for a bioenergy system, starting with processes to provide feedstocks, which are either uh, produced on field or which are being collected. So wastes and residues, for example, then there's kind of a transport or logistic process to some kind of conversion facility. And then afterwards, after a bioenergy carrier is being produced, there's some kind of distribution and an end use of the, of the energy carrier. Um, there are specific inputs um, that are being uh, considered. And within the example that we included in the guide, we are going to show you step-by-step uh, step for each, each of those processes, um, how we can calculate emissions based on these uh, inputs um, for a specific functional unit. So for example, when we consider the biomass production, there are things like fertilizers or for example, diesel that is being used for agricultural machinery, just as pointed out by Otavio or when we are at the stage of the conversion process, for example, there might be chemicals or some kind of energy that is being used to convert the biomass to an energy carrier. Um, then based on these inputs, we can calculate emissions. So what we call in the first step, direct process emissions. So for example, if you use diesel in an agricultural machinery and you burn the diesel, the emissions that are being produced are referred to or can be referred to as direct process emissions. Also, the application of fertilizers might have some effects regarding nitrous dioxide emissions. This is what we, what we refer to as a foreground system within our example. And then for some of these inputs, there might be um, upstream emissions or emissions from the production of these materials. So for example, in case fertilizer is being used or diesel is being used, um, these inputs need to be produced in another process, uh, which again might cause emissions and this is what we refer to as background system. And uh, together, both elements um, are calculated or we show in our example how we 
could how you could calculate them um, and together they build what we call the emission inventory for our system and then depending on questions like the one ones raised by miguel about the um, life cycle impact assessment methodology and the mass metrics for uh, the the uh, characterization of the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, those results can be converted into carbon dioxide equivalents, for example, for a specific product. So um, in, the, in the report, we have three illustrative examples, um, and I'm going to quickly show you one of them. Um, this is an example, of a simplified example for a biomethane production based on energy crops and uh, manure including an upgrading of the biogas to biomethane so that it can then be further used, for example, and feed into the natural, in the natural gas grid, or it can be used in, um, to fuel a car or, or something else, or to replace natural gas in some kind of industry. Um, we included a, let's say, general calculation approach. However, it's very important for us to mention that it's not the aim of the guide to present some kind of new standard calculation methodology. So um, in fact, the most important thing here for us is to provide some kind of illustrative example that we could use to discuss prominent and important drivers for emissions that should not be forgotten. It's not about the perfectness or the, the, uh, the accuracy of the methodology in general um, into the, let's say, finest level of detail. It's more about getting the most important parameters right and have them to be part of the equation. Um, so just to st start with a uh, with an example uh, within the supply chain, so focusing on the feedstock, the part of the feedstock production. In our example, uh, we consider different input materials. So for example, mineral fertilizer, organic fertilizer, and then of course, um, yeah, upstream emissions that are very different uh, for both of them. So for the nitrogen fertilizer, which needs to, the, the synthetic fertilizer, which needs to be produced somewhere, uh, we also include what we call the background system, the emissions from the production of these materials. Um, the use of diesel is very important. Also here we have direct emissions and emissions from the production of this material. There are things like, for example, lime application, where the same is actually true, emissions from the production of that material and the application. And then a very important parameter is um, the potential um, emission of nitrous oxide emission from the application of nitrogen to the field um, for the production of an agricultural feed, feedstock. Um, we give an exemplary on how to calculate um, emissions and then of course, how to um, convert from an example or convert from a result, which is given per hectare and year, for example, if you, if you calculate for a specific area, to convert to another unit, which could be, for example, a ton of biomass based on the on the uh, assumption for the yield that you make. Um, then, of course, each of these uh, of these chapters um, or sections in the report will focus on one of these specific parts of the process chain, and each and also includes a quick summary of the main and most relevant aspects in the assessment, so things that should be included. So, for example. In our case, we have seen that um, direct nitrous oxide emissions can be very important. So direct, direct emissions from fertilizer application, which can include nitrogen and lime, the use of energy carriers, so for example, diesel, and in some cases, the burning of biomass residues or the, or the burning of biomass in general, as also um, you have seen from Otavio's presentation. Um, then this is not part of this specific example, but there's an, there's an example in the uh, report. Emissions from land use change can be relevant. So we included two examples, the conversion of grassland to cropland and the conversion of degraded land to cropland, which will give you completely different results, but in general, hopefully an understanding about the importance of these parameters and the potential impact of these parameters on the overall result. And then of course, uh, the upstream emissions from the supply of input materials, for example, fertilizers. And if you look at, for example, um, the difference between uh, available synthetic fertilizers alone, these upstream emissions, um, usually there's a huge, they, there's a huge variation um, between, between different products and their related upstream emissions. Um, to continue, um, we also included uh, an example uh, for the 
um, for the conversion of the biomass that we just discussed to um, an energy carrier, in our case, biogas, and then subsequently biomethane. Here in this case, for example, what is important are uh, the supply of the conversion facility with energy. So electricity that is, for example, either produced um, dedicatedly for this specific pro process or that is being sourced um, from the public grid, for example, uh, the supply with heat, which can be organized in different ways. And then if we look at biogas uh, production systems, there are things that are very important. So for example, things like the loss or the emissions of methane, for example, which could result from leakages, um, the output of digestate, which could be used in different ways and which could, for example, um, substitute synthetic fertilizers uh, in different areas. So this is an important byproduct that has to be considered. And then um, emissions from, for example, the production of the electricity and the energy carriers that are being used. Also, um, with, for this specific example, in case manure is being used, um, in some cases and in some systems, it can be relevant to uh, think about substitution effects. So this is a specialty that, that you can see in the European Union, for example, um, where there's under the Renewable Energy Directive, um, the, the, the potential to give a credit in some uh, cases in case you use manure for uh, biogas production, because there's the understanding that um, the use of manure in biogas production systems can avoid um, emissions that would occur from a conventional handling of manure in livestock systems, for example. So th that's also something to be discussed and potentially to be included. So also here again, summarizing some of the main relevant aspects, direct emissions um, from methane losses uh, can be very important depending on the specific system. Uh, another very important aspect, especially for biogas facilities are digestate storage system, not only the allocation or the, the handling of the byproduct uh, digestate in your overall methodology, but also the system in which the digest date is stored with, uh, before it's being um, further used is very important. And there's a big differentiation between open and closed storage systems. And then again, upstream emissions um, from the use of input materials. So um, to complete the picture, um, for, the, for the sake of time, I will probably uh, not be able to go into the detail of the other uh, examples that we include in the report. But like I said, we have further um, examples where we look into other parameters. So as Miguel has shown and talked about uh, the indirect land use change, um, also direct land use change can be very relevant um, in case these, these, these uh, effects actually happen. So we show two examples where we discuss the potential impact from um, a conversion of grassland to cropland or a conversion of degraded land to cropland and to show how these effects can be included in the overall equation and the assessment of a specific uh, bioenergy example. And then thirdly, um, since forestry biomass and also the climate effects of forestry biomass are so important, we have a section where we discuss um, certain elements uh, related to forestry-based bioenergy um, aspects that are completely different, at least partly compared to agricultural biomass, which for example, relate to the temporal scale and the overall assessment. And we discuss a little bit uh, what could be relevant aspects or typical emissions related to forest, uh, forest bioenergy uh, chains. All right, so, so to, to summarize um, the, the project of this specific, uh, the, the report of this specific report uh, project will include an inventory um, of a wide range of tools that we could identify that can be used to uh, quantify the climate effects of bioenergy pathways. We included tools for bioenergy pathways and the biomass specific systems, models and calculators for agricultural systems and tools for specific emission sources and removals. Um, there's a section which focuses on a um, decision support for the selection of the right or the most appropriate tool for specific scoping questions. And we included an exemplary uh, discussion of important parameters in the assessment of greenhouse gas emissions for three illustrative pathways that we selected. So finally, to give you an outlook, um, we are currently finalizing the report. It 
I hope it will be finalized and um, it will be published in April. And I guess the publication of this report will be announced over the official IEA dissemination and commun communication channels. Um, also, if you want, um, please feel free to send me an email in case you want to get notified um, as soon as the report is available and I'm happy to do so. And um, with this last slide, I will give back the floor to, your, to you, Floor. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. And I think um, this report becomes in, uh, in high demand because uh, we first outlined how complex this issue is. And I'm very grateful that you shine some light on this complexity and give some guidance on how to select the appropriate tools, um, thereby only offering the tools. Of course, the problem is not solved yet, but at least give some guidance on how to quantify it and, and also when to use which uh, tool. So I think that will be very helpful for, for uh, a very wide range of, uh, of the audience. So many thanks for that. There was a question from the audience also, if uh, with the report also you have some just suggestions for default values, for example, for lower heating values, higher heating values, or some kind of harmonization, if that is included or um, or if that's aimed for in that report? Maybe I would not use the term default values, but we make reference to, let's say, existing standard works. So for example, in one of the slides I cited um, the, the KTBL database, which is a German database that is very frequently used um, to set up, let's say, simplified biogas systems. And they also include what you could call default values, for example, for biogas and biomethane yields from different kinds of energy carriers. Also, we give, will give a couple of recommendations um, uh, regarding, for example, emission factors or sources for emission factors that you could use when you want to calculate emissions from the, I don't know, burning diesel and things like that. So those type of information will be used, um, but we will not give like default values for overall results of bioenergy pathways or things like that. Uh, one more question coming uh, from Luc Bautmann. So how, how do mo the, the different tools and models deal with uh, biogenic uh, CO2 emissions? Um, that's a very good point, and that's um, that's very different, and that's one of actually one of the parameters that we use for the characterization. Uh, so when we describe the tools, this is something that that we will try to address: how specifically biogenic carbon is accounted for in the, let's say, regarding its climate effects. So um, yeah, it's part of the report and part of the inventory of the of the tools. So there's one more question on the, on how we uh, get our hands on this report. I think it's indeed a high demand. So uh, I think you mentioned it will be probably be published by the by April, right? It will be disseminated through the website. But um, to be sure, you can also be you can also be contact uh, Stefan, right? Yes, absolutely. Great. So I think for now there are not uh, any more questions. There are some questions uh, left in the chat, but they are specific for a specific case study. So I would like to invite the speakers one more to have a chat uh, on the Q&A in the chat. Um, and I would uh, give the floor once more to you, Stefan, to do some uh, closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Floor. Uh, before I do so, uh, Luke just made a very important uh, point and I just wanted to, to um... Yeah, to say that again, of course, it's not IEA that is publishing the report, it's IEA Bioenergy, which is the difference. So that, that has to be correct. Um, but that being said, um, yeah, th thank you. And again, thank you, Eta Florence, uh, Floor, and all the speakers for, for joining in today. Actually, when we compiled uh, the agenda for this webinar, we were hoping to have like three very different, but still um, complementary presentations. And I hope that we managed to do so. So Miguel's presentation was very much focusing on, let's say methodological aspects and also at least I, the, the way I saw it on a system perspective um, and a number of very important messages, for example, for the development of uh, bioenergy and biomass strategies. Um, it was very impressive to see the impacts of the methodological choice on the results. And what I really liked about the presentation is that uh, Miguel did not leave us alone with these wide ranges of results, but he was talking a little bit on the most important factors and most important methodological choices which could influence these results, such as, for example, goal and scope um, and reference systems and things like that. So that, that was, I think, a very good insight into these details of the methodology. 
Um, and then Ottavio was really zooming in and on, on four of these very important tools, which we also cover in the report for the project that I mentioned. And again, it was really interesting to see that these methodological decisions and choices that Miguel um, mentioned, they also, of course, play a very important role because they are the reason for these differences between the tools. And I think the question that Ottavio addressed is highly relevant. So how, why do I end up with different results if I use, I don't know, if I look at the same kind of bioenergy pathway using different tools, which is, which is a highly relevant question. Um, but like in, in addition to the take home messages that you brought up, Ottavio, one of the most important ones for me was that it's probably not good enough just to select a tool and to calculate, but you also need to understand the methodology behind it in order to also make the right interpretation for the results. Um, and then zooming out again, I hope that the, um, that the guide and the guide report will give a good overview on all the additional tools that are available besides the four mentioned by Otavio and a little bit of support uh, when selecting the right one for your specific question. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. I would like to thank uh, the speakers once more and also Eta Florence for this opportunity. Uh, it's very nice to see there's so much interest in this topic. And I think that also encourage us maybe to do a follow-up um, event on this because we see that an hour and a half, it's quite ambitious to, uh, to cover all the topics. So if you have suggestions to go into specific topics, just leave your ideas in the, in the, in the chat or in the Q&A. I would like to thank the audience for sticking with us for this very dense hour and a half. And I hope to see you next time by a next, uh, with the future events. Many thanks to all.